This is Geospinach, a new channel that aims to analyze warfare, analyze military theory and the science behind the theory of war, analyze geopolitics and introduce military strategy and various scenarios. So the applicability of what we're going to analyze in the theory of war. Now, myself, I'm specialized in geopolitics, warfare specifically, and the science of war and military history. Those, these videos are going to be unedited, mainly uh, they, they were going to work like a podcast. And the idea is to introduce to people that don't know about war, fundamental principles of war and the science of war. The thing is, a lot of things in military theory and in, in the analysis of military history, they tend to ignore the general picture and they focus on very specific things. So in that battle, there was lack of supplies and in that battle, they had one better tank. Yes, but war is much, much, much more complex than this. We can go over general military historians and military analysts of the time, from Moltke to Clausewitz and so forth, but that will kind of miss the point. The idea is this video should be as simplistic as possible. Now, this video is going to be a very general introduction to the science of war, how we are going to look war at this channel. There is no one way to look at war. And then gradually, each video will go through each one of these points at different levels and analyze them very specifically. And on the next series, it's going to be about giving battle examples and introduce the concepts we have learned in the theory of war to more practical examples with units. Also, there's going to be a series of geopolitical analysis, for example, an update of what has happened in Ukraine from a geopolitical perspective, as well as the military and the economic implications of that war. But now let's get into the video. Now, firstly, we're going to see war in the sense of four stages. First of all, we have the national level. So that's the geopolitical position of a nation. For example, in World War II, this is the map of World War II, uh, prior to the war. Uh, if we look, for example, Germany, and Germany specifically here, what is the position of such state? And how such state uh, geography, how such states manpower, resources, technology, its relations, the network of logistics, the military does not exist, the national does not exist, the levels of corruption, the rule of law, the informal, formal institutions, who governs the country, how all that influence that country going into war. And not only war, how it affects us geopolitically, but going to war, as Clausewitz said, is warfare is a continuation of politics. And here, while we will analyze geopolitics, and we go, we're going to there go there in deep, you know, our military series is going to be mainly about warfare, what and how things get influenced by war. By the way, the pinned that I have here, it's going to be uploaded on the YouTube, so you can check it yourself. It's a very generalized version of the main ideas. Many more will be added. Uh, as time goes on. But this is, again, an introductory course into warfare. It's for people that are interested in war, they don't have the time to spend reading military books, and they don't have the time to spend reading about a lot of battles, but they are interested to learn the fundamentals of war. So the first level will be the national level, the geopolitical, as I have mentioned. A small example here, for example, manpower. And we will go to World II. A big difference between Germany and France is manpower. The fact that that time period, Germany had twice the manpower. That means quite a lot when it comes to a nation and its ability to wage war. That has to do with how much manpower, how many casualties a nation can sustain. Okay, this is intuitive. Okay, war is intuitive. But then comes another level to it. How much is that nation willing to lose? So, for example, the United States losing 100,000 soldiers will be a national disaster for the Soviets. That's just a mere number, as Stalin mere said in 1941. That isn't to say that Russian lives are worth less, 
But the way the socioeconomic variables, the informal institutions that govern that nation impact its way of dealing war changes the whole narrative. So the Russian narrative, so if we look at the Soviet Union with a population in heart of around 190 million, had much, much more value than Germany's population of 80 million and even more value than France's population of 40 million. Not only because numerical, if we assume that each soldier lost for Russia is worth, uh, let's say, one in human value, in Germany that would be 1.5 and in France that would be three in World War II. Okay, these numbers are very abstract. The idea is that there are many, many, many variables that define war. There is not only one. And what we're going to observe in this series are to learn all of these variables that affect war. And now we're going to just going to go over the very generics of it. And then we're going to make a video for each one to generalize and one video for each one specifically. Now, moving from the geopolitical level, we go to the army command. By army command, I imply how the army is trained to begin with, how the soldiers are fighting, uh, are learning to fight a war, the equipment they, they buy, is the existence of the army prior to the war and the existence of the high command during the war. So that will imply the uh, Oberkommando der Heeres of the German army, the, the command of the German army during World War II, deciding, for example, okay, I have to have an offensive plan to attack Poland, uh, I have to have some sort of defense. This part of analysis doesn't have to do much with geopolitics. Well, it, geopolitics influences it as well, but it has to do with the general structure of the army and how you train your soldiers and how do you prepare yourself in war. Once you enter war, then you, once you enter war, the job of the army is to how to maintain that ability to continue the war. How do you re replenish your losses? How do you recover uh, from battles? How do you uh, create a supply network? And so forth. So the main variables of uh, the army command or the army level, whatever you can call it, actually will be the firepower. Some military analysts and theorists don't put so much emphasis in this, but I am of the idea that big boom boom wins wars. And that is proven quite heavily in a historical sense that the ability of to deliver one, enough firepower to one uh, location at one force at one moment will have much more consequences to the other side outside of the actual casualties that will come to the consequences of battle weariness so soldiers getting tired of war of decreasing morale of breaking communication and generally decreasing the organization of the army. Then we move on to the school of thought. How the army is choosing to fight its battles. Now there is not one battle plan, but not only a battle plan, there is not one way you fight a war. Maybe your principles of war is about being fast, uh, being able to penetrate the enemy forces, rely on initiative and circle, or maybe your idea is to exploit one of your benefits. So, for example, my favorite strategy, well, many will choose the Blitzkrieg of the Wehrmacht. My favorite is actually the Deep Battle of Tukashevsky. The idea behind it, this is a very small introduction, what we're going to do in this channel, is that I have a lot of troops, so like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of troops, but they are shit. Okay, and when I know I'm, and I know they are shit, I have the firepower, and I also have some better troops, like somewhere here, somewhere here. Let's say this is uh, overgeneralizing here. The idea, for example, of the battle relies on breaking the enemy forces and expanding the line as much as forward. So to uh, be able to stretch the enemy as thin as possible as for you to then exploit 
your manpower ability. Ah, okay, then jumping on a bit too far here. Why is that important? Well, there are some very important variables in GOR. For example, amount of uh, meters, square meters per soldier. So let's say, for example, I have 50 soldiers attacking in a 100 square meter area. And then I have artillery firing on them. Will they have the same casualty rate as if I had 10,000 soldiers in that area? Of course not. So the value of a soldier is heavily affected, for example, from the terrain. It's heavily affected uh, by the area uh, which is fighting. And this, uh, uh, learning all of these things are vital to building a school of thought that you plan to approach. And there is another thing, for example, the Anglo-Saxon school of war, or at least that's what I like to call it, the NATO school of war, has a centerpiece, for example, the protection of human life as well as the exploitation of enemy forces. But because they is seen within the nature of the Anglo-Saxon society to protect the life of the individual soldier, a soldier's value life is valuable, his death will have more severe consequences, will make these hard decisions even harder. So that model of war, for example, might rely more on reactivity and very planned through uh, maneuvers to limit causes, rather, for example, the more aggressive uh, Blitzkrieg, there's another German name for it, of fast warfare, which is all about fast mobility, breaking the light, whatever the consequence and take now to finish the enemy as much as possible. Now we're moving on to a bit more generalized, like the supply level, the technological equipment, like how good my equipment are, how integrated are the various arms. So my air force with my ground troops, how, how well do they communicate with each other? I may have the best air force, but if they can communicate with my troops, I'm fucked. And we've seen that, for example, in World War II with uh, the United States Air Force. It was a brilliant Air Force and devastated the German army. But the, amounts, the amount of times it hit its own forces, it's quite tremendous. The air-to-ground communication, the integration of those arms was quite limited. If we compare the Wehrmacht's integration of air-to-ground support, we've seen a much, much higher level of that. So that changes the whole way you fight your war. So each plane has different value for each army. Now, I'm not going to get more into details. This is going to be happening in a later stage. Now we'll move on to the unit level, the corp, the army group. Now, what do we mean by army group? So an army group is, I have a front line. That's, okay. give me a second. Yeah. I have a front line that's, yeah, okay. So, I have a front line here. And this thing is controlled by an army group. An army group will have below it a set of divisions of, or units. Call them whatever you like, brigades, divisions. We're going to learn them due time. How the hell is this guy fighting? What are the parameters that affect this specifically guy or girl, whatever? How is this area affected in comparison to the total and the rest of the field and in communication to the generalized uh, high command? Because you can have a situation where you have high rate, good quality equipment here that are really good high-tech equipment. I have a lot of supplies here, really, really good supplies here. But these guys are getting absolutely nothing, or at least a very proportion of it. Maybe I have a logistical issue. So choo-choo, from going here to here, there is a problem. Maybe there are partisans. Maybe there is the terrain. There are many, many th things that change completely how an army group fights and the variables which affect that battle group when it fights. Now. If we see more specifically uh, how important it is on the logistical level, for example, the, the manpower, I may be Russia and I may be, have a lot of troops, 
but currently I'm fighting a deep battle in the reserve pocket. So the reserve pocket was a, a, an area of land really, really, really deep in Russia. So the front line was something like this. Uh, okay, yada, 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 yada. Here, I'm having two army groups battling each other and killing each other at very, 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 very high rates. I may have an unlimited amount of manpower as Russia, but the amount of soldiers I can actually deliver to the front line are not absolute. There are many variables that are able, that affect this delivery. And that has to do not only with the amount of soldiers that I'm delivering, but the quality of that delivery, the integration of that delivery, and then we have a whole integration of the, of the units that gets delivered. So I have a unit, for example, if we observe Ukraine today, for example, like as a generalized example, it was part of the Soviet Union then. So I have the Ukrainian war and I have the Ukrainian defense. Now, the Ukraine currently is doing great, great at their war. But integration, for example, of new forces. So currently they were fighting with T-64 tanks, some T-72s, that's varieties of tanks. And then suddenly you have new Abraham tanks coming in, new Leopard 1, Leopard 2. So, okay, that those are really brilliant and great tanks. But can a Ukrainian soldier at the moment in the current front line really use and exploit the value of the tank? to the extent that their tank is able to provide. Well, no, because that soldier has been trained on that tank or there is new guys and the unit's cohesion has broken down. All of these things completely affect the way that the battle is going to be developed at the current army group level. So at the general front line. So uh, it's up to the brigadier, the, the, sorry, the... Uh, the field marshal of that army group to be able to organize and take into account of all these levels. And then we come to the first fancy stuff of war, which is the actual strategy of war, meaning I control a front line of, let's say, uh, we have two guys, the blues and the, uh, we have, okay, so we have the blue guy, the, this is, let's say, the front line, and I have the yellow guys here, 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 and here, and I have the pink guys, which is here. So each square, whatever you call it, it represents a unit. You call it the division, you call it the regiment, you call it the brigade, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Now, each group, like we see here, the pink group, is controlled by this high command. And in between, there is a terrain, and the same applies for the yellow guys here. So they are controlled under their own high command. It's up to these guys to create some sort of a strategic battle plan to be able to defeat the other guy. Now, something that a lot of people tend to forget in war is not about territory. The principle of war is very, very simple. It's about destroying the enemy force. If you can achieve that through constant offensives, if you can achieve that through uh, defense, offense, it doesn't matter. The idea is very simple. Destroy the enemy force. So at the unit level, this is where we're going to be playing uh, most of our focus, is to see various strategies that can be implemented. So a first line, single line defensive system, double line defensive system, uh, mobile reserve systems, various school of thoughts, of approaches to war, uh, uses of new and older technologies into warfare, and how all of this integrate together in creating, first of all, a battle plan, and secondly, how one officer, high command officer, can react to various situations. Now, we haven't talked about the very specifics of war, uh, of uh, the fundamentals that affect battle this is going to happen in the end. Uh, here on the document, by the way, you can see very small descriptions of examples of what I will play. Feel free to check it out yourself. I don't want to spend too much time on it.
And finally, we go to the actual divisional level. So what I mean divisional level? I mean the division, I mean the brigade, the company, the regiment. So for people that don't know, because many don't, and that's okay. So you have the divisional command, okay? So in a division, you have around 10 to 20,000 troops. Now, some say, oh, it's 12,000 troops in, uh, in NATO. Some other will say, well, in China, they have 15,000. I, I don't care. I don't care. It, it varies. It's a, a lot of guys. And these regiments are divided, see, these divisions are divided in regiments. So much smaller groups. Each regiment starts to become specialized. But what makes a division special? And division is the idea that while it's specialized at one form of way of battle, so it's an infantry division, so it implies that it has its uh, preliminary consists of infantrymen, or it's a, it's a mechanized division, so it's an infantryman that have the ability to move and they have some armor, it's a rifleman division, or a militia, whatever you want to call it, so it's majority riflemen, no artillery. It's a combination of a lot of different uh, factors, um, equipment that can be used together in an organized manner and thus be able to operate independently under some general instructions from the guys here at the army level. So this guy is saying to three divisions, attack that position there and you will attack with whatever money you're going to attack. The guys here, now the division, has to actually move the correct regiments into each position to launch that attack. And what it does, it practically mimics what happens at the army level, at the core level. Core is something above the division. So it has like, it can have, it can have like 100,000 troops, 200,000 group troops, or even 50,000. It consists of many divisions. So it acts really similarly because it is independent, but at the same time is much more limited and is the one doing the actual fighting. Now, what affects a division directly is what we're going to study here in, in our upcoming sessions. It, going over it right now is mainly the morale, the battle fatigue, and the current supply a unit is, uh, is possessing, the quality of the troops and the quality of the replacements of those troops, firepower, I can't specify how important firepower is, and supply and firepower go hand to hand. If I have 24 artillery pieces, so one regiment of artillery, and the other guy has 10 artillery pieces, but that guy has like almost unlimited ammunition, and I have only very limited ammunition, then my artillery pieces are practically useless. So supply, firepower, armor, uh, equipment in general go hand to hand together. And maybe on the army group level, um, our supply situation is pretty decent, but let's say we're in, in the front line where, uh, let's say, the front line looks something on these lines. Okay, so imagine this is like 50 kilometers, so this will be, let's say, 50 kilometers. Okay, and within that, I have a division here, and it's fighting, and a division here, 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 uh, let's say here, and here, okay? And the other guy, I'm going to draw the divisions, is attacking from multiple sides, but it's really, really, really focusing its attack on this part. Maybe the whole army group level, so the guy that controls all of this its supply level is pretty good so let's say it's almost full it has the ability to supply the guys though fighting at this point here their supply level gets massively reduced day by day their battle fatigue that would implies how much tired soldiers get gets massively diminished you can have the best troops in the world fighting, receiving very few casualties, and in a matter of few days, gets completely routed and destroyed just because of a lack of supplies or just because they were exhausted. Those are very important and fundamental variables at war. It's not about having the best tanks and having the best tactics. 
some things are very, 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 very simple. You can't have guys fighting seven days continuously. They're like, there are human limits. That is something that a core command has to take into consideration when choosing to put various units into various positions. And while we're on that topic, while we're going to cover it on a, on a video on its own, I really, really, really want to put emphasis on routing. Something that many, many, many people don't really know. The majority of casualties in war does not occur while in combat. This has been done through ancient times. The majority of casualties occur during the routing phase. So if this is much more simplistic in, uh, in medieval battles or in ancient Greek battles, so you have, let's say, one phalanx here, so imagine these are like a thousand guys and you have another phalanx here and there are a thousand guys here and they're killing each other here. And the casualty rates is like 100 from the thousand, you have 995, 990 and yada, 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 it goes down. What happens at one point in the battle, one one side or the other, for whatever reason, will its morale, its battle fatigue, its discipline, the general organization of the unit starts getting diminished. So, for example, maybe you have a very loved officer in the front line killing and hitting everybody and he dies and the guys around him getting panicked and start retreating and it causes the whole unit to gradually withdraw. That unit, the moment it loses its organization and it, it, it truly stops being a cohesive unit, what you end up with, it's a bunch of humans, still a thousand, nine hundred and ninety, ninety, over there. You have some of them that are still fighting, some of them that are still organized, some of them that are fleeing for their lives. And at this moment of the battle is where Everybody dies. It is where the uh, the attacker in this case will cause the majority of casualties. So it's really important to understand the routing phase. If you want to eliminate the enemy, the most important thing is to put him into a position where he will be routed and then being able to deal the killing blow. The worst things you can do is after being able to win a battle, not being able to take advantage of the routing phase and, and eliminate an enemy. In the case that this doesn't happen is what we refer to as a pyrrhic victory. So yes, you won the battle, you gained the control of the battlefield, but you didn't manage to heal the killing blow to the enemy. Being able to route the enemy and being able to understand when the routing is occurring is a very vital part in war. And it's something that you be, have to be able to distinguish. This is what Clausewitz has called to the, the gravity of the battle, to really decide the hitting blow that we've got to eliminate the enemy and then move in and kill the prey. If you don't move in and kill the prey, that's when the, the battle is actually lost. And all of the rest of the variables here, all of these variables, all have to do to maintain a correct cohesion of force, as not to be routed. Routed is the worst thing that happened in an army, and it's a thing that's always happening uh, in armies. To conclude this video, not to get longer, for each of these points that I've mentioned here, and many, 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 many more that I haven't mentioned, I will make different videos giving an example and showing how each one of these variables can impact uh, the unit. I will try to keep it theoretical and not don't go specifically to historical examples. I may do that way later in the future. That has to do with personal beliefs of individuals and very specific historical and non-historical accuracies, but mainly because the point of this series is to teach the military science. And it's up to the individual to go by himself and learn those battles. That's actually the coolest part about the concept of military science, being able to read uh, a battle, to read the outcome of a battle, to read how a battle is occurring and actually understanding what's truly happening.
And we will analyze battles in the future, but currently it's all about the science of war. And in general conclusion, here I have the main, main, main principles of war. So the most important variables that affect war. As I mentioned prior, firepower. How much boom, boom can I deliver to the enemy? And at how much short time, the precision I can do in, how much I can maintain the firepower. The more firepower I can maintain, the more the willingness and the morale and the organization and the cohesion of the enemy will force. Now, another one, and that's a very important one, ability to penetrate the enemy force. All of the things mentioned above, some things I skipped over. It's intelligence, it's scouting, it's communication, it's armor, uh, the ability uh, to be able to penetrate and, the, and actually break the enemy force at that point. So even if a unit has much, a, 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 sorry, a, a, a whole core has much less troops than the other guy, if they have the ability to penetrate, that ability has a set limit. So let's say it has uh, 100 troops, 100 tanks. How are you going to be able to use those 100 tanks to the best of your capabilities? Maybe you are the United States and you have like a limited supply of tanks. But at that moment, at that battlefield, you have a hundred tanks and you have set amount of time to complete an objective. This is your penetration ability. And your penetration ability after you engage in combat only goes downwards. It's up to you to be able to really understand how strong is your penetration ability, your ability to break through the enemy lines, and how and when not to use it. So maybe you have a really strong penetration power, but the enemy is quite entrenched. And that's something you should avoid. Now, another thing I did forget to mention here is actually entrenchment. Entrenchment is the king of defense. Wherever you go, you dig. Wherever you are, you use terrain to your advantage. Entrenchment is the is the keystone is this shield is what gives the defender the advantage in most battles for example if you are defending a city and you have the time to entrench that city entrenching the city will imply uh, using strategic positions in various um, city centers and so forth an entrenched position so when i'm referring to a position being entrenched means very well defended and use of uh, terrain can stop any attack despite how low quality of troops they are that's why you may hear from other people saying attacking a city is the worst example called putting and tell him entrenchment is vital now going over the rest the ability to shock the enemy force that also connects with firepower and penetration. So shock and surprise, all of these things end up in reducing the organization and the cohesion of the enemy force. So as I said prior, once organization and cohesion gets reduced, then the unit becomes closer and closer to the routing point and the moment it hits the routing point is where you actually win the battle. And again, we have the intelligence to the enemy that also fits to the loop. And then, and supply, which, well, supply is the key of everything. And morale, which fits directly to cohesion. And we have one more very, very, very important variable here that I'm going to separate at the rest, which is adaptability. There is no battle plan that survives actual combat. Precise battle planning prior to war is very important. Yes, Molki the Elder did specify that no battle plan survives combat, but at the same time, uh, Molki also mentioned how important very concise battle planning has to be. So what will imply? It will imply, for example, for an army group, if it's going to conduct any offensive, it has to have pre-assigned supply depots to go in to give to the units. It has to have pre-assigned replenishment troops and replenishment equipment for those lost. If you don't have the right equipment, then at least train your troops that the once they lose their equipment, to be able to use those equipment. All of these are part of the planning phase. And then war changes. Something really wrong happens. 
in intuition and the ability to adapt to extreme situations is one of the most important variables in war. A commander at all levels, from the geopolitical to the very lower officer on the front line, they have to be able to adapt to different situations. And adapting means, at that moment, in combat, being able to understand all of the things mentioned here and all of the things mentioned above and all of the things I haven't mentioned yet and being able to make a concise decision of what the heck is going on. So you have to understand, okay, okay, I'm collapsing, my troops are collapsing. Do I have enough manpower to actually hold my position or do I retreat? What is the right choice? All of these choices are heavily affected by the very fundamentals of the science of war is not only randomness is my position entrenched maybe it's better to get encircled you may hear okay, what the fact why would i want to get encircled there's a nice example i try to give let's say we have team a that has five units and then we have team b that has four units and let's assume team b the yellow guys are on average better than team uh, A. So team A attacks, so the attack in a battle plan, and the battle plan of team yellow, it's something of those lines. So they don't know, for example, where their attack is coming in, and they have their forces a bit spread out. Maybe they are planning an attack on the right. And they don't expect the attack, so an attack happens. So plan, team A attacks, manage to break the line of team B. The Some units of team B gets confused, gets disoriented, and we end up in a situation like this. Okay, what do we mean by adaptability? So you have the yellow guy here. You can see my mouse. So you have the yellow guy here. He can stay and fight, or he can choose to retreat. Let's say this guy he's entrenched. So the position he currently holds has been reinforced. They have been digged in. It's a forest, it's a mountain, whatever you call it. It's a really good defensive position. So they, they suffer some casualties. They are suffering from battle fatigue. Their supply level, let's say, is decent. And they are getting attacked from three, three, three sides very heavily. Now you may think, okay, they have to retreat, but retreating will directly cause them to have way more casualties. And then their total army groups start to get fucked. And then here comes the idea of adaptability. Maybe the right choice for that unit is to stay, stay entrenched. Maybe that unit will try to withdraw that unit to form some sort of organization where the scenario of war will be that if you have an encircled troop and that encircled troop uh, still has the ability to attack so it still has armor yes it's encircled but it still has armor it still has cohesion it hasn't loses control and so forth so we come to this scenario so it's encircled by three sides. So if it's, if it's encircled by two sides, then it loses the whole point of a second. So you try to encircle it. And then you have your other two guys. But then the yellow guys now have a scenario like this. So now, because you've chosen to stay in your entrenched positions and thus suffering much less casualties, yes, your battle fatigue is limited and your amount of time to stay there is very limited. You've given a very, 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 very strong advantage to these guys here. These guys can do a lot of things to destroy the enemy. So the, the team A can be really, really destroyed by its own self. So that's the what we imply by adaptability. There is no right solution in war. It's all about constant innovation and constant initiative to changing war scenarios. This actually has been done... Uh, in one of my favorite battles, which is the miracle of the Vistula in the 1920s, uh, go to this map. It doesn't really show here, but the the Polish front line that were fighting the Soviets uh, was looking something on those lines, something like that. 
And the Red Army was like really, really, really focusing here. Like uh, their idea was to jump in and destroy and destroy Poland. The, the Polish army was collapsing. They were pushing in. The only thing that remained was the Vistula River that was in between and some very strong Polish and trench positions, but generally very weak units. So what the Polish uh, did, and for some reason my brain now I'm forgetting the name of the uh, Polish general, sorry for that, concentrated their very remaining troops that had the highest breakthrough ability, as we mentioned, power. So not high power in this situation, because they were generally lacking firepower, but mainly breakthrough and shock. They managed to fool the Russians that their units were really, really depleting, they had no reserves, and they managed to do this. Just by pushing in, the Russian forces here got so much panic that they lost the cohesion and even if they had way, 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 way more troops than the Russians, in their attempt to escape the upcoming pocket, the casualties they received were so massive and so devastated that that battle almost guaranteed Polish survival. This is just a pure example of there is no right solution to war. Maybe that battle, battle plan would have lost. I mean, according to some Soviet historians, if uh, Putin, if uh, sorry, if Stalin uh, was supposed to do the job he was supposed to do, he shouldn't have been uh, uh, encircling uh, Le uh, Lvov as he was at the time. But he, sh he the, the idea of uh, at that time was to attack on the right uh, on the right side of the Polish army. So if Stalin then, as a commander, had done that, maybe. Uh, the Polish plan will have been a massive failure. Now it will be a massive joke. The idea is there is no an absolute truth in war. It's all about understanding the variables that impact war, the science behind war, and well, what's important in war. And understanding this helps you understand geopolitics much, much better. Now, thank you for this video. It has been a bit longer than I have been expected. On the next videos, I will either try to give uh, take specific examples of uh, and, and elaborate on them or create various war scenarios, play with them and within the war scenarios explain various situations in war. So we can examine, for example, how can a unit conduct uh, retreating operations and why retreat is actually one of the hardest operations for a unit to conduct. Or, for example, what are the priorities when it comes to naval invading an area, like what a unit has to do, uh, what is the procedure behind it, how do you prepare that planning, uh, and so forth. If you're interested, please subscribe. And this is it. My name is Andreas Panashis, and goodbye. And always remember, more sweat, less blood. Erwin Roman.